130. Out of the depths I have cried to thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. This is a good one. I should pray for this. Let thine ears be attentive and let thy voice uh, to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, should mark one's iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul does indeed wait. And in his word I do hope. For my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord always. And with the Lord there is loving kindness. With the Lord there is abundant redemption. And he will indeed redeem Israel from all his iniquities. What do you think about that? I think it's a very good prayer. Well, it speaks of a lot of things. You can break it up really into, well, uh, four pieces. First of all, my wife accuses me of one thing and she always gets kind of sarcastic. And she says, are you, how old are you? And I'll say, you know, I'm 67, why? And she goes, are you unable to ask for help from anybody? And you know, she's just being a smart aleck is what she's doing. She goes, the reason your arm is busted, because you won't ask for help. The reason this got busted, you won't ask for help. The reason this never happens, because you won't ask for help. What is wrong with you? And you know, ministers, especially ministers of one horse churches like this one, it's easier just to do stuff than to ask somebody to do it for you. And that is not intended as any kind of statement against the congregation. That's just reality in general. Uh, I need to do this or do that. And Chuck's, I know Chuck's working. And you guys are on vacation. And you guys are working. It's easier just for Chandler to do it and say, boom, it's done. Don't worry about it. You know why? Who gets the Christmas tree for the sanctuary every year? You know, who puts up all the Christmas? You know, well, late of late, the, some the ladies in the Bible study have helped. But for many years, I did it myself. And it was just easier. And Benny was, you know, Benny taught my wife, I guess, because she'd go, are you too old to ask for help? So anyway, it's just easier in the ministry business. Who gets the lilies for the Easter service? I thought Benny did. No. You have the truck. I have the truck. <laughs> and no, I won't help you move. <laughs> Who gets the point set? Who gets the whatever we need for this church at Sam's or Costco? Because you have the truck. Well, yeah. That's what you that doesn't have. mean I have to do it. <laughs> and Carol says, well, ask for help. I said, nobody else is going to want to drive down there. Who gets the prizes for the cook-offs? You know, uh, uh, magically enough, those th little lunch carts just don't appear in my desk. Somebody has to go get them. And a lot of times in life, that's who we are. We just won't admit we need some help. And as we do it in real time, real life, we often do it with the Lord as well. I used to have a professor, and I'd say, Prof, this is going not so great. I'm having a hard time this and this ministry. He goes, well, have you prayed about it yet? Uh, you know, I can lie and say yes, but the fact of the matter is, not really. I haven't. Have you taken that care or that concern to the Lord? Well, it's not that big a deal. I don't want to bother him. You know, he's busy. <laughs> that's what we think. We don't say it out loud, but that's what we think. And our prayer time becomes what? Well, we're driving between one job and another, and we're going, Lord, help me get through this day. And then we push a burger into our face and curse at the guy who just cut us off. And that's about what prayer life becomes. We can't be honest with ourselves to say, Lord, I need some help. I don't feel good. I'm in trouble. I've made some bad decisions. I've taken a beating because of it. And I just can't do this anymore. Can you intercede for me? How many people do that? Nobody. And you know what they end up? Oh, you do. <laughs> but 
Usually they end up, you know, uh, taking drugs until they OD or they pick up a gun and shoot themselves or worse, they shoot other people. When I was driving through Atlanta and the rain, I was yeah, that's true. I've been in, through Atlanta in the rain. In fact, most people, the only time I see them praying in this church is when they're riding with me somewhere. <laughs> Prayer life gets very good in the front seat of my truck. It's amazing how many people are called to prayer. Um, so, first thing we got to do as Christians is it's, it, it's okay to need God. How many of us really believe that and know that? You know, not too many Christians do. The first evidence of Christianity, when you stand before the Lord and He says, let's see if you really are a Christian, the first thing on the checklist that God's going to look at is, have you ever really needed me for anything? Because if you don't need me, everything else is just probably going to be lip service. You know, oh Lord, you know, our Father who art in heaven, how be thy name. It's a great prayer, but we've said it so many millions of times that it's just mostly rhetoric when you think about it. Well, there it is, you see. We don't think about it. We just go through the memories, don't we? Rote memory. What God's going to ask is, do you really need me? This is what some spouses should ask each other. Do you still really need me after 44 years or 38 years or however many years you've been together? My answer to that question is yes, she makes a lot more money than I do and I need her to keep me in the lifestyle to which I am accustomed. But do I really need Carol? Does she really need me? Not do you want each other, but do you need each other? Would your life be altered considerably should she leave or should you leave? Answer that question. I'll talk to you about how strong or not strong your relationship is. Do you need God? Well, the same thing with God. That's the first question he's going to ask. And you know how we prove this? When we cry out, Lord, help I need you to intervene. That's the first sign that you need God. Something beyond your control. What's the second thing, do you think? What's the second thing on this list God's going to check to see if you're a true Christian or not? Well, if you have a need, what do you do? Yes. You conf yeah, confession. Confession doesn't have anything to do with your needing God's help. Confession has to do with you not able to do it. How many of you make it a habit or a point to confess your weaknesses to everybody? You know, this is what I don't understand about dating. You know what dating is? Basically intel, right? Girls go out with guys you know, for the first time and you're collecting information, here's the ratchet going, ay caramba, you said, don't take a lot of it. I didn't understand her either. But nevertheless, she's saying, well, he's tall, that's nice, he's slender and in shape, that's nice, he looks handsome, that's nice. But this is surface stuff, right? And if he turns around and says, oh, that's a beautiful blue dress you're wearing, I love it. Most women go, oh, this old thing, I just threw it on this morning. It was the only thing clean I had. Oh, I love your new hairstyle. This, oh, God, the guy cut it too short. It's all curly and crinkly now. And, you know, the part's wrong and it's gray. I love those, you know, that swimsuit. It, oh, no, let's not even go there. There's everything wrong with a swimsuit. Why do women do that? And that's just not my opinion. That's in the wisdom literature in the Song of Solomon. Remember when the king came and met the girl and said, wow, you are the most beautiful maiden I've ever seen. And she goes, oh, my scent skin is all burnt brown and swarthy because I have to work in the vineyards and my fingernails are dirty and I didn't polish them this week and my rear end is too big. And she's going through this whole list of stuff that's wrong with her. <laughs> all this guy said is, hey, how you doing? You are one hot mama, you know? How do you spell me? How do you spell the word me? 
M-E. M-E. What you left out to you? Uh, huh? You left out the word you, or the letter you. Well, see, the woman would respond, there is no you and me. And that's the line I used to use back in college. There is no you and me. And I said, but there could be if you'd like to go out. Ah. <laughs> Clever, you got them now. Boom, they're hooked. They're on the line. All you got to do is reel it in. There is no you and me. I says, well, there could be if you want to go out. And then they start with the, oh, well, I can't. My hair is nasty and my ears are sagging and I'm donating the kidney and my, you know, my rear end is still too big. And Stop, will you? Let's just go out. Get a pizza. But that's not who we are. Somehow confession is absent in church, but when it comes to dating, women are right there putting it all out front. Telling us all the mistakes, all the flaws, all the, you know, shortages on whatever part of their body they want to talk about. How easy is it for us to confess to someone else, but not to the Lord? Listen to how this goes. Out of the depths. This guy's pretty far down. I mean, he's hit the bottom. He didn't start when things started going bad. He waited till he hit the bottom, exhausted all his energies, exhausted all his assets, and now that he's broke, he's got nowhere to go, now he cries to the Lord. Oh, by the way, Lord, I need some help. What's the Lord saying? Well, I'm glad you're asking me, but why didn't you do this when all this mess started? Were you too stupid? How old are you? Do you have a problem crying out for help or help asking others to help you? That's my wife, people. Out of the depths I have cried to thee, O oh Lord, please hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you're going to listen to anybody, he's saying, I need you to listen to me now. If thou, O oh Lord, should mark our iniquities, the times we've failed against us, who could possibly ever cry out to you? Who could stand? But I know there is forgiveness with you that you may be revered as the wonderful God you are. This is confession, people. He's saying, I ain't all that that I thought I was. But I remember and I know that you are. And if you're going to hold my iniquities against me, well then, you're never going to answer my cry. But in order that I can revere you in my heart and in my mind and in my soul, please do not take into account my iniquities, but instead answer my need of help. How many of us talk to God in this way? Very few. Usually we're making excuses down here. Well, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. If they hadn't gotten involved, then it would have gone perfect. And the Lord is looking to see not just the skeletal framework of a Christian, but the whole Christian matured and worked out. Well, you know what? Nothing speaks to maturity like admitting your shortcomings and asking his forgiveness and to help. When Christ, you stand before him, and he's going to ask, uh, well, Jeremy, how Christian are you? Is it real or is it bogus? He's going to have a checklist. He's going to go, have you ever needed me? Well, Racha, have you ever confessed your weaknesses and appealed to substantiate your need for me now? Do we have that kind of relationship where we can trust each other and love each other for better, for worse. If we don't, then I'm not your bridegroom and you're not my bride. See what I'm saying? The imagery that Christ uses. He wants intimacy. Well, what does intimacy involve? Do you really need me? I like uh, Fiddler on the Roof. You ever seen that? With Tevi in the end, toward the end of the movie. He's lost his daughters. Everything's gone wrong. He's lost his home. The city, you know, the bulldoze in the village. He's got to get out. And there in the kitchen, he asks his wife, do you love me? 
And of course she says, what are you nuts? Have you drank some bad water this morning? And he's dead serious. He says, no, do you love me? I've cooked for you for 38 years. I've cleaned for you for 38 years. I bore you three daughters and children. I've done this, I've done that. I've kept our house at home. Not what I'm asking. Do you love me? But Lord, I've gone to church. I've served on two committees. I taught Sunday school for summer and vacation Bible school. Not what I'm asking. Do you love me? People ask all the time, how do you know when you love a man? Or how do you know when you love a woman? Well, you could ask these kind of questions. Do you need her? Does she need you? Are you willing to put yourself out there honestly? You know, that's a big problem in social media. You read some of these personal ads and that stuff, at least from what I hear, I don't read them. But you think you're marrying, you know, Mar Marilyn Monroe or somebody, and you get there and it's stumpy McGraw. And, <laughs> you know, she drives a tractor and she weighs 700 pounds and eats Slim Jims for every meal. And you go, what happened to Marilyn Monroe that I was marrying here? Or, you know, any other starlet. Why do we do that? Some go so far as to put pictures up there that aren't them. It's somebody else. Why do we do that? Because we can't even be honest with ourselves. God's going to ask, do you love me? What's involved in love? Well, need, honesty. What's next? Read on. They put their hope in this. Genu genuinely. The third thing on the list is we put our hope and our trust in God without which we ain't got a prayer. We realize this isn't the last resort. God never wanted to be the last resort, although we can wait till we hit rock bottom before we call to Him. God doesn't want to be the last resort. He wants to be the only resort. Every spouse, the same thing. I don't want to be, you know, uh, one of the last women you ever know. I want to be the only woman you ever know. I want to be the only man you ever know. I want your hope in this relationship. I want this, your hope in this life is to put us, the two of us together and that's it. That's all we need. And there are thousands of scriptures to speak that speaks to this, both Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus says, will you leave me also? And what was the answer? Where can we go? Where, should, where can we go? What other is there other than you? When he said that, he's saying, Lord, you are our only hope. Our only Lord. Do we see our spouses in this direction? Well, you know, you, I could tell you a true story, and that is my mother remembered the day, the hour, the place, and even what they were wearing on her first kiss, when she first kissed my dad for the first time. Two young people, he was getting ready to go off to war. They hadn't even talked about marriage yet. But she could remember that first kiss and tell it in a story to make you believe you're there watching and witnessing it. Today, women can't even remember their first husband. You know, <laughs> they've been through five of them. And they're going, oh yeah, he was a plumber or something. I'm not sure what he did. I remember I always saw his rear end hanging out of the top of his pants. That's, he must have been a plumber. Only hope. Not just the last resort. The only hope ever. Now, do you have that kind of trust, that kind of openness, that kind of need? Chances are pretty well, pretty good, that you're becoming the bride of the bridegroom. I know mine and they know me, said the Lord. I know mine and they know me. There's rhetoric like that everywhere in scriptures, everywhere. 
And the final thing is, even though it hadn't happened yet, what do you think it is? Chapter four, or no, number four on this list. Redemption. Assurance. This isn't an if, or, or maybe, and. This is a God will deliver, as he promised. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. This is a how. This is a for sure. I have no doubt. You know, that Abraham, from the beginning of the whole Israel nation, he trusted God and lived in that assurance, even though he didn't know God yet, hardly. Assurance. Jesus said once, if he said a dozen times in the scriptures, go your way, your faith has made you well. How could he say that? He said it to a lot of people. Go your way, your faith has made you well. Jesus is acknowledging in their heart and in their mind that they really do trust him and believe that even though they're not fixed now, he will answer. The apostles had a problem with that, you see. And they couldn't, they hid themselves away. Only John was the one that went to Calvary. He said, I don't care what happens. I'm going to be with Jesus because I am assured that he is the hope of the world. He can fix my brokenness. And I don't see anybody else on the planet that I need more than Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross to watch his Savior die. He ran to the tomb to see his Savior alive. He was the one with his head upon the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. What does all those things tell you? This guy trusted his Lord. Don't you wish you had husbands like this or wives like this? How strong could the marriages be? You know, the average uh, for divorces in this country, first of all, divorce is up to 66%. Of everybody that gets married, uh, two out of three are going to be divorced within five to seven years. You're never going to see that 25th silver anniversary. You're never going to see that 50th golden anniversary because you'll be out the door in five years or six years or seven years. And you go, Tom, that's terrible. It is. And you know what else? God and we go to church we're going to be fine oh not according to the statistics this is not the divorce rate amongst the heathens out there the pagans in fact quite the opposite they're doing a little bit better than we are this is the divorce rate amongst Christians according to Kerygma and guys like that and the James Dobson group 66% Think about that for a moment. Why is it so high? Well, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Peter couldn't give him an answer. He asked him again, do you love me? And Peter could not give him an answer. He finally said, do you love me? But he lessened it from agape to phileo. It means Basically, are, are we at least friends? And finally, Peter said, Lord, we're friends. But Peter never got away from the phileo up to the agape. Yes, I love you without measure. How many of us do that? How many of us put our hope that strong in the Lord? Oh, I go to church every Sunday. I didn't ask you that. I asked you, how many of you love God enough to put your whole hope, your whole world in His hands? I thought I did once, and obviously I didn't. I wanted to be an advertiser. I wanted to write those stupid things you see on television and say, oh God, look at that guy. Who wrote that stuff? I did. 
And the Lord said, and he has talked to with me and said, this is not the path of your life, Jenner. Yeah, I've got another one for you. It's not going to be easy. You're going to hate it more than likely. But I want you to go down this one. I went to seminary, newly married, got back from my honeymoon and got the acceptance letter. We loaded the trailer, went to seminary. We hadn't been married a week. We had no money, not a dime. I pulled up in front of the seminary with my e-haul on the back with a little bit of junk we had. And Carol sat in the car for four hours while I went in and took my first Hebrew class. I came out and I said, well, now we got to go find a place to live. And the Lord made, we stopped at the only grocery store in the entire town called the IGA, which is about as big as this room. And I was standing in line just trying to get some peanut butter and jelly so we could have something to eat. And a professor named Don Holland uh, caught me and said, hey, you're new. I haven't seen you around here before. I said, no. This is my first day here, and I gave him the quick recourse of what happened. He said, so you don't have any place to live? And I said, no, not yet. And I said, well, let me tell you, there's uh, Dr. Dennis Livingston, and he owns a bank building that burnt down. I said, that's great. <laughs> what am I going to do with a burnt down bank building? He goes, well, the bottom floor is still burnt down, but the top floor, he's turned into three little apartments. They're kind of cute. He's not asking much, and he's, all three are empty right now, if you're interested. So Carol and I moved into a burnt-down bank building apartment. We got the nice one that overlooked the one road that went through town. And it was even better because right behind the bank building was the railroad tracks. That was fun. You know how much freight and cargo they haul on the rails in the middle of Kentucky? all the time, day and night. So we moved in there for $100 a month, which we didn't have, but a benefactor back here at home from the church, we assumed it was anonymous, told us they would pay that rent for us for the three years we were there. Did I arrange any of that? No. Did I plan any of that? No. But I told the Lord I would go, but he would have to do something because I sure haven't got the means, the energy, the effort, or even the want to do this. The this that I'm talking about is ministry, seminary, ministry, pastor, your whole life, from now until forever. No more advertising. 45 years here I am standing here telling you this. Am I assured in the Lord? Do I think he can get it done? Yeah, pretty much. Do I think even in the darkest times his light can shine? Pretty much. I used to have a friend who also is a pastor. He, he <clears throat> sadly left the pastor because his, he just had some mental issues. He's a soldier in Vietnam. And he was on a recon group that would go out and hunt for the enemy. And of course, that's the worst thing you can possibly get assigned to because the enemy lies in wait for you all the time. And most of his squadron was killed, shot and killed. He was shot once, but not killed. And he used to tell me, Tom, you know, the worst part about being a soldier is when you have to pull guard duty and you can't even get a good night's sleep. And I said, is that when you got into God? And he says, oh, yeah. I'd be sitting out there up to here in water and a rice paddy. My rifle cocked, aimed, ready to go, shoot anything that moves. If I see a leaf moving. And my prayer, he said, my prayer was, God, please let the morning come just one hour earlier tonight. Let the light come up. I don't want to die in the darkness alone where I can't see anything. Honest to goodness, that was his prayer every time he was on guard duty. Lord, let the morning come just one hour earlier. That makes a Christian man there. You're not going to stand that watch too many times before you say, Lord, let the hour come just one hour earlier. I can't do that, but I know you can. Save me. 
Psalm 130. It's a song about what really makes a trusting, living relationship. Those four elements. How do you like me now? How do you like me now? Now that I'm on my way. Don't be Keith. <laughs> All right. What's that? I will do another psalm next week, and then that'll be it for a few weeks. I don't think you were in here when I made that announcement, were you?